thanks everyone for coming. Um, so colleague, my colleagues and I at ThoughtWorks have been um, working on microservices architecture and building s systems under microservices architecture for a little while. And I'm super excited to bring some of the stories and our learnings from around the globe for you tonight. But before we start, I'd like um, to ask you to raise your hand if you believe you work on principle. If you can think of one or two principles that really guide your work, you know, those values that um, energize you, motivate you when things get tough. Anyone? There's one person there. Okay, quite a few. Um, yeah, so I, I, I like to think that the reason I'm here and my colleagues behind me um, also here talk about, talking about microservices is that microservices at its core um, does have some of those values that really resonate with us and we care about them. Um, but it's only in real world when we pursue those values we realize how bloody difficult it is to actually implement them successfully. So to give you some ideas of those values I'm talking about is, um, you know, uh, distributed and collaborative development that is absolutely impossible without having some organizational empathy. Uh, being able to work autonomously with responsibility and have decentralized governance. So we go out there, we pursue these you know, values, we try to build the systems, we get hurt, we learn, we improve and adapt and repeat. Before going to the core of this talk, uh, which is about the stories, um, I'm going to try to establish some baseline definition of microservices, what microservices architecture is and what it isn't. Uh, we're going to talk about you know, those values and principles and equally the challenges that come with attempting to implement you know, them. I'm going to go really fast, uh, I guess, around the first part of the talk because uh, I've kind of assumed you, you've done your homework, you know a little bit about microservices, and I also want to get to the core of this talk, which are the stories. For each of the stories, I try to give a little bit of technical information about the practices that we use or the technologies we use around that. So first things first, um, what is a microservices architecture? It is a style of service-oriented architecture. It's clearly an overhyped one with an amazing turnout tonight. But it's the first service-oriented architecture that has come after continuous delivery. It's founded on continuous delivery practices, rapid deployment, you know, automation of build, environment provisioning, and so on. It's a fine-grained service-oriented architecture where the services are built around capabilities of your domain. So in this picture, I've tried to demonstrate an online retail capabilities, such as you know, shopping cards, product catalog, payments, uh, fulfillment. These are those bounded contexts within the domain of online retail, each of which can be implemented by a single service. And one of its most important properties is that each of the services can be deployed, can be built and deployed independently. Go from conception to production absolutely independently of the rest of the services in that system. And that level of loose coupling is only possible if we use um, you know, language agnostic integration um, technologies, open standards such as HTTP and so on. So what microservices architecture isn't? It's not a monolith architecture. It's not a monolithic architecture, or for the Rails community here, a monorail. Um, and by that I mean, you know, regardless of how good you are and how disciplined you are in breaking down your application in logical modules and packages, as long as the application is being deployed as one unit and operated as one unit, it's a monolithic application. Microservices architecture is not a layered architecture where you break down, you know, decompose your system around pieces that implement cross-cutting technical aspects of your, your system. For instance, you know, a layer for UI, a layer for services, a layer for middleware, a layer for database. Um, that's not a microservices architecture. Also, microservices is not a set of dumb services that are integrating with a very smart and intelligent integration layer. Um, you know, the layer that 
holds a lot of your business logic, how you route messages, how you transform messages, USB, you know, usually the ESPs in the enterprise or um, this is a very common, I guess, architectural style at enterprises from service-oriented architecture of the 90s. And lastly, it's not services that are integrated through database. And this is a style that we see in the digital frontiers of enterprises, where in the digital, you need to, in the digital departments, you need to kind of break down the applications to a bunch of services. You can serve your different channels, your web and your mobile. And on the surface, it seems like we have these nicely decoupled services, but when you look behind the scene, they're still accessing the same data, same you know, system of record, and they couple through the data layer. So hopefully, now I have established some baseline <laughs> definition of microservices and give you an idea uh, what it looks like. So let's go through the values and principles. I'm really sorry, it's being cut off, I think, here. I'm not sure if it's that screen is a little bit better, but here it's partly cut off. Um, so the values and principles, the benefits. Why, why are we doing microservices architecture? The one that I love the most is this one. Autonomy with responsibility. So we build teams um, around microservices. One team will implement one or multiple services. They have control over the destiny of the service. They can cut through the, you know, the, the translation layers of organization and they go directly to the business, understand what it is that they're building, the capability they're implementing, and then they're responsible in building it, testing it, deploying it. And more importantly, with that freedom and autonomy comes the responsibility of operating it, monitoring it, and get the call when the service falls over. So the team's completely in charge of the full life cycle of the service they're looking after. Another benefit that a lot of that, you know, organizations want to get, and that's why they're moving to microservices, is the rapid, um, rapid feedback cycles and rapid deployment and rapid release. It's much simpler to change a small service and deploy it to production rather than synchronizing 50 streams of work coming together to the release state to, you know, to deploy a large piece of software that is tightly coupled together. Also, um, if you break down your domain into subdomains and allocate teams to solve problems of those subdomains, you can scale your operations quickly. Companies like Netflix have arrived at microservices architecture because they had to respond rapidly to the growth of their online services. So scalability is another benefit that you get with microservices. If you have a set of, you know, set of APIs small services, it's not hard to imagine that you can compose them in a variety of ways. Composability and building different set of applications is another benefit. The smaller the pieces of, um, you know, the, your Lego pieces are, uh, the more versatile your construction is going to be. And if you're interested to absorb new technology, have you know, a polyglot environment with different tech stacks, again, migrating a small piece of code or a small microservice to a new technology is much easier than uh, migrating a monolithic application. You can also use a di different you know, operation environment for your different services depending on their performance requirements. And lastly, the cognitive load on the developers. For me, it's much easier to understand a piece of, you know, a small piece of code, a small independent microservice, rather than thousands and millions of lines of code. A colleague of ours used this, um, you know, analogy that the size of a microservice should be the size of his head, though he does have relatively a large head. Um, but the way I, I interpret it is that I should be able, as a developer of that microservice, understand the, you know, the, the context and understand um, the, the capabilities of that service. So I managed to fill up this slide with lots of values and benefits and we are probably feel very warm and fuzzy right now. Um, so, but to implement these values and getting the full benefit, um, there is a set of complexities that get introduced in our environments that we need to manage them. 
It's great we have autonomy, but these autonomous teams are made of people. People build walls around themselves, they silo themselves, so they could be a you know, communication overhead across different service teams. We talked about the rapid deployment and speed of change. That is absolutely impossible if you don't invest in the automated you know, execution, if you don't change the way you test, the way you deploy, the, the way you provision your environments, you won't be able to get the speed of change. Now that I've, we have distributed our domain into lots of moving parts and lots of services, now we have to deal with the consistency, resilience, and all the problems that come, challenges that come with implementing a distributed system. And we have this wonderful set of APIs and our consumers you know, have put them together and build weird and wonderful applications. We need to maintain all those APIs. So we keep expanding our capabilities and APIs and maintaining that is difficult before we can collapse back and you know, um, not support all the versions. So the versioning and supporting the APIs is, um, is, a, is a maintainability uh, overhead. And with our tech diversity, now we might have you know, a Cambrian explosion of species in our environment that we need to operate. And the way I think about this is that every one of us in our uh, work environment need to have one of these giant granularity sliders and really find the right place for, for, you know, for ourselves where the net value of the value and the complexity is a, is a, is a net positive. Um, and it's really different for every environment. The, the name micro is a little bit leading and people think, oh, now we have to go and build you know, 50 lines of code services with 50 lines of code, but that's really not um, true for all of the environments. Some environments with more complex business domains, the services granularity, it's a little bit, you know, um, I guess, larger than, than, than other environments. So Ryan works in San Francisco. He works in a fairly complex um, business domain supply chain and he has a few things to share. When practicing microservices in a complex business domain, it's very important to pay attention to the right level of the service granularity and the service interfaces. It's not all or nothing, a monolith or nano services with 50 lines of code. In a complex business domain, it can be a challenge to evolve towards an ideal modeling of your business capabilities, especially if you're in a green field environment or you're adding a lot of new capability. I've been recently working a lot in the supply chain and there it's common to have a product design concept, a product catalog concept, planning, and these concepts if represented as microservices may or may not have very complex interaction patterns that make it difficult to reason and evolve a design. In fact, in the work that we've been doing recently, we found a lot of needs to move attributes and behavior across some of these services as we discover the right modeling. This can be complicated if you have third-party packages that have their own design concerns and worldview and that are influencing or backing those services. So the discovery process has typically been slowed significantly by having a microservice architecture and having to refactor across it. One of the major things is that we don't have IDE support. In static languages, we can refactor very quickly across service interfaces. On the other hand, for microservices, we're in the dark ages, doing most of that work by hand. In fact, we're maintaining additional things like contract tests, which wouldn't have been present in a monolith or in a macro service. Multiple teams also can become silos to doing the right thing. Communication is significantly higher if multiple teams are managing the different services. And possibly negotiation becomes an issue. More people owning more ideas means more overhead. You never know less than you know right now. So splitting too soon can make things very difficult to reason about. And it will likely happen that you will learn in the process. Be cautious. Monoliths mean you have domain expertise. And in those cases, splitting is often easier to understand. Rich domains and doing evolutionary architecture, on the other hand, are difficult in a microservice environment, and you should be cautious about the level of granularity that you move to as you're learning. So Ryan talked about a few things there, but the point that he emphasized was the domain modeling and how finding the right boundaries and the right you know, bounded context for your, um, for your services um, is important and how could it be different if you're in a green, you know, in a brownfield environment where you have already know your domain, you already got a monolith, you want to break it up versus greenfield when you're just discovering your domain as you go and build the services. So 
I'm going to talk about a few heuristics that you can apply if you're in a brownfield and already have a monolith and you want to break it up. That might help you. So the first one is the bounded context that we referred to before. So finding you know, where th those capabilities and different domain bounded contexts are in your environment, where the definition of the words and the language changes. For instance, product in, in supply chain when you're in a styling or design phase is a completely different entity than product where you in you know, ordering phase and sell uh, or purchase. So finding those themes and finding kind of bounded context is, is one way of dividing your, your monolithic application into services. The second one is the rate of change. Your, you know, your application deployment would be as fast as its slowest part. So if you want to experiment with a capability um, and, and deploy much more rapidly versus you know, a, part of a different capability that doesn't change as fast, you can use the rate of change to kind of isolate that into separate services. Team structure, organizational structure could also help. So um, Melvin Conway in 1968 as a programmer observed that um, companies, organizations that design products, the design of the products are constrained by the communication structure in their companies. So what it means is that what we build is usually reflecting the team structure and the communication lines that we have. And long time has passed since 1968 and we're still observing the same pattern. So use that as, as a tool to find the boundaries. So if you have the, you, you, you're in a part of organization that you see you know, a good communication line and a, you know, a team that is maybe more closely located geographically is in the same position, use that as a tool to you know, to allocate a service development to that team or the area they're looking after could be separated as a separate service taken on. And stating the obvious, um, start with the parts that, you know, hurt most. If talking to your legacy system is hurting you or integration into a third party um, package hurts most, um, start building facade microservices in front of those legacy systems or in front of those vendors to help with the change of language or the boundary between the domain. So these are a few things we can do with the, um, sorry, um, brownfield. And, and, and usually we say, look, we do have, if you use, you know, um, static code analysis tools, it will show you the boundaries you have already in your libraries and your dependencies. This is something that um, the video does not play. Okay, I can't actually show you. I'll try one more time. Oh, yeah, that's kind of place. That's um, so this was a code analysis that Scott and I did two years ago. I don't know if you remember it, Scott. And it was a monolithic.net code. And we got these dependencies across um, namespaces. And it is absolutely impossible to see those themes until you drop it into D3 uh, edge bundling, um, hierarchical uh, bundling algorithm to be able to actually see where those dependent or coupled packages are to break them out. But I'm not convinced that I actually want to pull these dependency out and now kind of surface it to my infrastructure and to my services. So be cautious. If you use the dependencies of your existing systems, probably they might have the right you know, level of coupling. And, and, and also, when we build systems, um, we kind of condition our business to, to, to the way that we have systems. So probably our business processes are now tightly coupled and they have weird you know, feedback loops. So if you also model your services from your existing domain, um, be cautious of those tight feedback loops and tight couplings that exist. So what do we do with Greenfield? Um, we, you know, one, one, one tool that I have been using to discover the services and these bounded contexts is to go through user journeys, to go through uh, business processes. And this picture is not supposed to be readable to, because it's actually a user journey from a client of ours um, that I worked with. 
But you, you get the idea. You have these user flows. You can go through them, sit down with your you know, domain experts, get sticky notes out, and write down the verbs and the nouns, and, and find you know, those kind of mm, bounded contexts to model your, your services from. And you can start with sticky notes, or if you want to have a little bit of fun, you just write a JSON file and dump it into Neo4j as a graph database, so you can you know, see the dependencies, run all sorts of cipher queries to find out how these bounded contexts you know, relate to each other or, uh, or interplay. Uh, so it's a little bit of a modeling that you have to do in the, in the greenfield to kind of find the services. So we've done the modeling and I've discovered all these you know, wonderful bounded contexts, but do we start with writing 50 different services at the same time? Probably not. So going slow and doing it evolutionary in Greenfield, it's something that you may want to start with. Uh, one service at a time and if one service doesn't hurt, then we do two services and so on. And maybe starting with, you know, a, a monolith in a green field and then break it in out, breaking it out um, would, be, would be okay. And the other thing is, when it comes to the boundary of the services and design of services, we, we know these principles. We apply them to our code when we write, you know, classes and functions and so on. So the same, to me, the same principles apply to your infrastructure and services now. Um, one service should do only one thing and one thing really well. The things that change together should you know, stay together. Um, those principles kind of apply. And I, and I sometimes try to you know, kind of convince myself that I'm seeing some fractal beauty here. The same principles apply to code, they're now bubbling up at a different scale and I can see the same principles. So we've talked about you know, service boundary and how to break down a service. Um, how should we design our teams to look after those? And Evan has um, many good you know, years of experience with that, and he has a few things to share. So shared services are one of the hardest things to deal with, things where you've got a, an, an application or a service that, that actually needs occasionally to be changed by multiple teams to deliver new functionality. And where we were evolving to um, is that the, the teams will be long lived and they'll be structured around supporting or providing custodianship for a set of services or business processes and people. Um, but you need to reserve some capacity for people to take their badge and their gun and, and go out into the organisation to enable the rest of the organisation to make changes to those shared services in a safe way, in a sustainable way, without uh, basically reducing the overall quality of the service. So Evan talked about long-lived teams. Um, many places I've worked, um, the, you know, the teams kind of form to do a project, they collapse, they throw the product they produce to the BAU team. Another project team forms, collapse, they throw the pro you know, product to the BAU team. With microservices, you kind of need long-lived teams that look after a service. You know, they have the vision for that service. Uh, however, um, you may want to, you know, there might be some shared services or shared capabilities that you need to look after. So you can have a model of fluid team membership. Um, and also you may want to, you know, flex your teams depending on the capacity, whatever people are working on that at the time. Um, so long-lived teams with fluid tem t team membership. And everyone was saying that, in fact, uh, their core engineering team had only one fixed member who was Evan and the rest of the teams just, you know, people coming into the team and, and, and leaving. And also he mentioned, uh, okay, you, you know, you're not part of that team, but you want to make changes to the, to the shared service. How can we make changes but retain the quality uh, for the code? And one of the tools they use is just, they use Git um, enterprise and they use the pull request workflow where as someone who wants to make a change to the service I fork the code I make the changes I send the pull request to the custodian of that service or the you know maintainer of that service and then we have a review and conversation so and um, I, I merge the code back up so a few things you can I guess try with with the ownership of the service and the ch collaborative coding um, on shared services but 
when it comes to now, you know, building and testing the services, um, Kent has a few stories, war stories from the front line. So with microservices, one of the advantages uh, is that you can quickly make small changes to services and get them out into production. And so one of the ways that you come at this is writing contract tests for each of the services. On my last project, we initially started off writing our contract tests, and we wrote them in the language of the client, but they were really much more provider contract tests in the sense that you would add a new feature to the service and then you would change the contract test that was associated with that. Um, but then we realized that that didn't actually allow us to deploy these to live with confidence because it didn't necessarily matter that the service agreed with itself. It mattered that other dependent services you know, were getting what they needed out of that. So then we started to evolve towards consumer-driven contract tests, but then that created a lot of complexity in our CI environment because you start to raise questions like, well, if you have two different teams working on services and the consumer uh, service changes, you know, needs something different out of its dependent service, is it allowed to check in a, a broken contract test that then fails the dependent service? And if so, now you've got coupling between your services and your CI pipelines. And he could go on and on and on and on, but you had to cut him off. Um, so, Ken talks about consumer-driven contracts. How many of do you do consumer-driven development here? A few. So I'm going to just quickly recap what, what consumer-driven contracts are. Um, we all agree that um, integration is really, really hard. Um, and the scenario is usually like that. Um, a developer writing a consumer service and I'm really upset because I can't really test my service every time I push the code you know, and, and submit my tests are failing because the downstream service I depend on doesn't behave exactly this, the way I expect it to behave or it's not there or um, the environment's flaky or whatnot. And as a provider, um, you know, developer that implementing the downstream service, my feelings are really hurt because there's nothing wrong with my service and everything's just fine. And believe me, I witness this every day at stand-ups. So the naive solution to that is, as the consumer, I just go ahead and write my mocks or stops for that service so I can go continue with my life and develop my service. And as a provider, I would just beef up my you know, API tests and contract tests. But the problem is with that is that we are just validating our probably invalid assumptions based on what the other end need to do or should do. So what could happen instead is for the consumer to write a bunch of tests that describes its expectation from the service for the service provider to run and the service provider to provide the mocks. After all, he's the one writing the service. Um, our friends at realestate.com.au, they have developed um, you know, a, a um, library called Pact, if you're a Ruby shop you can use, which does, um, which does that. As a consumer, I can write and produce these packed files from my pipeline, which describes my expectation from the server, and the service can run them against its, um, its own test pipeline. How do consumer-driven um, contracts help us? Um, this is our usual, it's a very simplified version of our pipeline. Uh, we have these different services and moving parts. They, you know, each have a pipeline to build and test themselves independently. And then we push all these services into the integration environment and we battle it all out to make sure that all the pieces are playing nicely together and run some acceptance tests and push them all together into production. With consumer contracts, um, we can do some magic here. I'm just going to do some magic and you will see it in a minute. Um, this is what would happen. Uh, so with consumer contracts, you, those little colored boxes are my consumer contracts that I run as a service provider on my pipeline. So I kind of replaced integration testing, with, hopefully, with a consumer test. So um, now as a service provider, I can make a change to my service, on my pipeline, I run all the consumer contracts, make sure I haven't broken anybody else's expectation, and then push that change forward. So it's a way of kind of decoupling in um, our pipelines and heavy dependency on integration testing. 
Right, so we tested the services, push to production, um, what next? So after a, a, a project that was successful, one of the teams wrote down a, a set of proposed standard health check endpoints, uh, a set of URLs that would expose information about a service. And they shared a, a, a library that would make it easy to, to publish those uh, service endpoints or health check endpoints out of an application. And because they made it simple, and that became a, very quickly became a standard across our organisation. Very simple to, to use as a human using a web browser or, or a command line, uh, but also easy to hook up to our monitoring. So these service URLs would expose the application version, the, the current health check, heartbeats for load balances, as well as more detailed diagnostics. So I think that the lesson I, I, I took from that uh, team was keep it very simple, keep it, keep it plain text, make it accessible to humans and, and make it a simple standard without being laborious. So I asked Evan for those endpoints, and these are some examples of that. So this is a public API that you can hit on realestate.com.au, and this is the curl output. Um, you know, it, an endpoint for getting heartbeat for load balancer that you just, it just returns the HTTP status code. Um, everything's okay, 200. Um, another endpoint, diagnostic status negius, where they, um, actually return the, the, the status code and some simple text that Nagis checks and understands and is part of the larger monitoring that they have set up. And this one for humans to read, if you can read it um, from there, it's the diagnostic status diagnosis which returns the full um, HTML and some descriptions that it's all good. So that's fairly simple and very useful. Um, but when we come to monitoring microservices, it's, uh, the, the, the environment is a little bit different, right? So we don't have one application to monitor. Now we have a network of services monitor. So we need to have means of aggregating metrics and information from a network of services um, and be able to make sense out of it. So um, there is an ecosystem of open source tools that we can use, such as Graphite, collecting metrics, you know, doing some form of uh, uh, filtering and so on and graphing on top of it. Um, it's just another JavaScript library to get uh, fancier gauges and, um, and um, visualization. Another tool that I just come across recently and played with and fell in love with is Riemann. It's an event processing um, kind of process. And what it does, it doesn't store any events or information, but you can kind of feed in the streams of events from any source on your network, any of your applications or uh, you know, pieces of hardware that you have, or, and then you can write code to aggregate, filter, um, roll up all these events and then push them out to set alarms or push them to graphite or any other dashboards. And the really neat thing about this one is that unlike other you know, tools that you always have to write some funky DSL that can take you so far, you can actually write closure code as expressions to manipulate and do all sorts of aggregations and um, transformation on the events that you get from network of services. But what, why just do kind of passive monitoring? Uh, so we can do monitoring a little bit more proactively by synthetic transactions. So one thing that we are trying to do is to package our journey test, end-to-end -end tests that kind of go through the journey of applications and just publish them to, the, to our production environment and keep them running in the production environment to catch nasty bugs really early. And you have to do a little bit of work so on an online you know, retail you don't end up buying products for your test um, as, as they run. But that's, they're also very useful in, in kind of doing monitoring a bit more proactively. <coughs> more from Kent on operational complexity post-production. In software, there's certainly good practices and bad practices, but typically the more interesting questions are around trade-offs. Um, do I do something now or do I do it later? Uh, am I optimizing for X or am I optimizing for Y? 
uh, microservices are certainly no different in this regard. Uh, on the one hand, they allow quick deployments of small changes to production. On the other hand, you now have a much more complicated CI pipeline that you have to look after. Uh, similarly, you know, microservices are small and easy to reason about as a developer, but now my environments are complex and much harder to reason about as a developer. Um, so thinking about these trade-offs with microservices, I, I think they're particularly interesting when it comes to greenfield projects. Um, historically, microservices have been more around decomposing monoliths, um, teams that have built up a lot of code and experience and are unable to sort of ship as quickly and easily as they want. So they start decomposing these bits one at a time in a controlled manner. But now that microservices have become popular, um, it's more common for people to start with them. Um, and th we did, had this on my last project. Um, we was a greenfield project, and we chose microservices because we, we need to get up fast. Um, we saw the appeal of having bounded context. Each team could own its microservice and its pipeline, um, and uh, you know deliver that. Um, on the other hand, you know, it required a number of us to sort of run around frantically at the beginning, once again making these trade-offs. You know, where do you cut corners in terms of all of the ceremony that's required on uh, microservices? CI pipelines, no, can't cut corners there. Um, you know, uh, server you know, um, standards, practices, shared code, service templates. Uh, you know, there's just it turns out there's a number of these things. So once again, you come to this consideration of, you know, what are the trade-offs that I'm willing to take? Um, and for instance, one of the things that we decided to defer uh, was having a, you know, sort of a real logging uh, approach to logging, you know, in terms of having correlation IDs that went through uh, all of the various services and having a sort of a robust set of automatic logging. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the end, you know, that was something that turned out to bite us. Um, so, you know, if I were to go back and do that again, I would put logging sort of much closer to the front. What would I pull out? Not entirely sure. But, you know, greenfield microservices, I'd say be really careful with those trade-offs. It's kind of interesting to hear Kent and Brian touch on a, a similar, you know, kind of concerns when it comes to greenfield development, microservices development. They haven't even met, though they have the same accent. Um, but Kent also talks about logging and correlation IDs. Um, logs in the past were kind of used as post-mortem. Something goes wrong and uh, you know, an issue is raised and then you go through your logs to figure out what it was. When it comes to microservices, logs actually another source of real-time monitoring. Um, there are ways of finding out how the services are interacting uh, with each other, how the transactions are distributing through your network. And one of the th things you can use is, uh, is the concept of correlation IDs, the IDs and the GUIDs that the consumers produce. And as these GUIDs kind of go through the chain of um, service calls, they kind of hierarchically get composed and um, you know, created, and you can always see uh, if if an exception raised somewhere, you can see what correlation ID it was raised against, and kind of go through the um, uh, chain of calls and 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 find out where it happened and uh, what the root cause was. Um, again, another you know kind of ecosystem of log processing tools that are out there, Log Stash for aggregating the logs and Kibana on top of it for filtering and searching. That kind of gives you similar capabilities that, um, as proprietary tools like Splunk. But with, you know, with really good logging and monitoring, what we have now is um, if something goes wrong, if a problem happens, we can, we can identify it quickly, we can find the root cause quickly, uh, but none of these are going to actually stop from the problem happening. Um, and building resilience and stability uh, in microservices is a bit different from monolithic um, applications. With monolithic architecture, the state of the system is fairly simple. It's either up or down. It's just binary. With microservices now, we have all these, you know, kind of fragmented system and network of services. So they could be all up or they could be all down or you know, they could be mostly up or they, you know, all up apart from one or you know, the, the important ones up. But the point is that this, now you've got this double-edged sword that you have um, more points of failure, more independent po points of failure and how can you assure that if one not so important service fails, the whole system doesn't come down and build resilience in a distributed system. 
And um, luckily, Michael Negard has written this fantastic book, and he has, you know, a, a, a few, I can't remember, seven or eight different stability patterns that we can, we can build into our applications. And one of the ones that I kind of understand and I relate to is the circuit breaker. So the idea of circuit breaker comes from electronic circuits. And it has definitely helped me a lot. Um, this is what happens at my home on the weekend when I make breakfast. So we, I you know, put the coffee machine on to make coffee, and then I toast some bread. And at the same time, I boil water to make poached egg, and the circuit breaker in my power boat opens. Um, otherwise, I would have burned my house down a couple of times so far. And the idea of circuit breaker in software is the same. You kind of wrap your service calls with the circuit breaker functionality, and you go through these states. If, if everything's happy, the downstream services are up, the circuit is closed, the calls go through. Um, let's say a downstream service goes down, and now the, the call's failing. So after you reach a threshold of failures, maybe a threshold in a rolling window, now the circuit breaker goes, no, I'm going to now trip open and not let the calls go through. So uh, an eager consumer doesn't kind of cascade failures and bring down the system. So we go into the open state and stay there for some amount of time. Don't let the calls go through. And now, after some time, we come back to this half open state, make a call. If it goes through, we go back to closed, happy. If we fail, we go back to open. We prevent the failures cascading. Um, if you are a Java has, house, Netflix has you know, Hystrix, which is a command pattern built to cater for um, and implement circuit breaker. And it has some nice features as what, what is your fallback when the circuit is open? Uh, do you want to go to memcache? Do you want to return some can data or return no data and so on? And it's also really neat that um, it, it can also expose metrics um, out of the circuit breaker as you make the calls so you can know on the dashboard whether the circuit is open or the circuit is closed. Right, so having services in production and watching them and monitoring them, that's just the beginning of the story because those services evolve and change. So James has had some experience with that um, to share. So I've been thinking about the projects that I've done recently and over the years. And I think consistently one of the most painful things is when you have to integrate with a, another service especially ones that are built inside your own organization. Primarily that's painful because of this integration dance that you have to go through, that you send some emails, you organize some meetings, you get some out-of-date Word documents, maybe you get access to a test server that you can poke around in, but overall the whole process is very ad hoc and kind of painful. And next time you integrate with a different service, it's a whole different dance. And that's just really painful and really crap. Um, and it just doesn't scale, is what i found. When we work on these architectures that have more and more services involved with them, we can't be investing the time to manually discover how each one works. So the big kind of revelation that I had was that these people that built HTTP and hypermedia, uh, they actually kind of know what they're talking about and we should probably listen to them. So I've had some very successful architectures recently where we've done true hypermedia with links and programmatic um, navigation of APIs. We've had situations where we can refactor services, deprecate services and introduce new ones without consumers of them ever really knowing that it's happening. They continue to navigate links the links point to a new location or they redirect if they need to be permanent and things carry on you know we can change the shape of our infrastructure and our, our systems without the consumers really knowing and that has been the real big takeaway for me that consistency externally is incredibly useful it can really help you with ramp up times and it can really help you uh, with everything really, with testing, with integration, with discoverability, it, it's all just so much easier when the services themselves are self-discoverable. 
So James not only has great hair, he has also great wisdom. Um, I asked him to perhaps share the, what he, the code, the, the, um, the messages, the HTTP messages that he was talking about for a project he worked with. And this is very similar to what he worked on. Um, so he worked on a tracking, tracking API to track your orders. And what he meant by this self-discoverability of the APIs was that, um, okay, we, we, let's say we arrived at the root of the tracking service. We call, we send the options request to st for a documentation. Let's we'll just see what's happening on there for the purpose of documentation. And it says order status API root all things related, to, um, all things order tracking related. And we can do a get on the root. Um, so we do a get on the root and we discover more information. We discover that if we want to go to orders, then there is a link that we can just follow. So we follow now, um, do a get on slash orders to see the orders and we've got four items there and we're interested in the status of course, we're tracking the orders. So we just follow our nose again and there is another link, orders, templated link, orders ID. We follow that and we arrive at the status. So the delivery is in progress and it's out for delivery. So this kind of, you know, these breadcrumbs left through the URLs and just following the URLs allows us, gives us that flexibility of if you want to change these URLs, the, you know, the consumer won't get affected by it. Consumer just follows what the links, the hypermedia links to the resources that the services provided. So I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, Scott is going to challenge how we view the domain and how we model the domain. I've seen a number of microservices implementations go awry because they fail to think about this problem of modeling the business as a sequence of domain events. So actually understanding what are the business events that occur in your domain and then making a provision for storing those, for storing them over the long term and exposing them in feeds to other services. This is something that it's more helpful if you plan for that up front. It's very difficult to retrofit that kind of capability into a system once you've already built it. So history, history is the version of past events that people have decided to agree upon. It's a different way of looking at the world. The way I've been looking at the world, loving state machines, is through states. So I um, mean, one state event happens, my state changes, I go into another state. I have an account with 100 bucks. Um, a credit event happens, I update the account state to 150 bucks. Debet, the debit event happens, I change the account to another amount. So the focus is kind of on the state, and when we model the domain, that's where my, our focus is on. What Scott is referring to is kind of flipping the focus on the events. So forget about the states, think about the, state, the events that are happening. Those occurrences of actions at specific points in time and be able to kind of project the states from those events. So let's put that in the context of domain modeling. What do we do usually? We're pretty good at, you know, modeling entity-centric services. I'm sure everybody has a customer service, right? We love one of those. Um, we have a credit service. So they, these are very well kind of understood entity-based services and they have their own bounded context. We get a little bit more sophisticated and then we have this activity-based you know, capabilities and services. I have to, um, I have a purchase activity now, it needs to talk to two different entity services to get the customer information and also to get the credit to be able to put the order through. Um, so far so good, you know, we, we have a little bit of dependency but that's fine, they're all living their own nice bounded context. But sometime, you know, at the, the, in the, during the project, and usually not that early in the project, late in the project, we get these funny little features that just don't fit in this model at all. They don't have a ba nice bounded context. Um, features like notification boards. They need to know about everything and anything that happened in any bounded context. Search, go and search everywhere. 
um, reports. I need to give reports on you know, any entity that existed in any bounded context. So they kind of break this nice bounded context concept and then to go through all the different domains. How do we implement that last minute in the project? Um, nasty ETLs. So we just go through the guts of the database and pull the data out and you know, give it to the notification and search and they just have to make sense, whatever they can make sense of, right? It probably what, the, what we have modeled doesn't fit them. So alternative to that is treating events from day one as first class citizens. So every service could store the events based on the action has happened. Customer registered and at certain time given and given the information about that or you know credit debited purchase or uh, order purchased so every service could just keep a series of these events and also publish these events on its endpoints and allow any consumer to come and consume them and replay them and project the state that they are interested in from these series of events and really uh, what's really neat about this is that we can f build features retrospectively without even knowing we needed these features. Um, so the classic example of that is gamification where you actually don't know what the you know, functions and the rules of the games are until you've played the game, until users have interacted with the system. So if you keep all the interactions of the system with a user with your system, you can kind of replay it and then you know, build features and apply whatever rules that make sense based on that interaction. Um, I, I, I feel, that my, I myself getting my head around it and building, you know, systems that are kind of doing event sourcing, but I feel it kind of needs the same um, mind shift that we had going to functional programming from OO programming, but it's quite exciting. So JR worked on a microservices project for quite a while and he has a few honest feelings to share with you. I would like to talk about one thing that I'm glad we did and one thing that I regret we didn't do uh, to ensure um, low coupling between the services in our my last microservice project. Uh, the thing that I'm glad we did is um, really consider um, aggregating data in the client itself as opposed to um, uh, creating a new microservice or a new endpoint for that. So, for instance, what we had is that we had a, a screen where we wanted to display uh, general customer information alongside uh, financial information related to the customer. And uh, what, we, uh, what we decided to do is to uh, make several services calls in the client uh, and not create a new endpoint. I like this idea because uh, the client is is naturally a good place to uh, to I think do a aggregation and orchestration. This is at the end of the day what it is uh, to provide a, a coupling user experience. And the other thing is that uh, when you actually implement that in the client, you're closer to the client, so uh, you you got a, a better informed um, a context for knowing whether you need to make a, a synchronous call, an asynchronous call, and how it's going to impact the end user. Uh, so really, I'm glad we did consider uh, using the client. Uh, as opposed to uh, a new uh, a new microservice. Uh, the second thing that um, I regret we didn't do is really um, enabling asynchronous communications uh, using something like an event stream, which could be implemented using uh, uh, maybe uh, some kind of uh, enterprise queuing system or uh, you know an Atom on RSS feed or maybe rolling out our own. So basically, what we ended up having is a complex workflows that involve synchronous and asynchronous usually being implemented in one service, which creating a, a very high coupling and making those services uh, uh, more difficult to maintain. So really, if you know you can have complex workflows, uh, I would uh, really consider uh, rolling out early some kind of event stream. So um, some of the points that I guess JR had were mentioned by Scott as well about uh, around event sourcing. Uh, but one, one point that he had was you know, composition of the APIs, um, composition of sync or asynchronous APIs, where do you put that? Well, you put that naturally closest to the place that you have the most context 
And usually the context, the most context, is closer to the user in your client. So what he liked doing was you know, be the client being able to compose different APIs as opposed to building another aggregator API uh, to aggregate from downstream system services. And what that does, um, what it means is that then you need to have finer grain service APIs for the composability by, by your client. He also mentioned the complexity of you know, having synchronous and asynchronous calls. And I think the, the scenario he was referring to was the customer registration that has a, a couple of you know, synchronous steps that you have to create the account for that to be successful or you, you know, have to set some other information about the user. But then there were a couple of asynchronous um, requests and forgets and an email notification back to the user or set up an account um, record in the ledger system for the customer and so on. And, um, you know, he, he referred to having an um, event queue for doing that or um, enterprise service bus, but that, that, that's not the only way. If you want to do you know, asynchronous calls, then we can do reactive programming. Be able to scatter the request, let them is asynchronously get processed, whether they fail or they succeed, and then they get notified when the requests are gathered. Um, and I'm not even going to pretend that I can cover anything meaningful about reactive programming tonight, but if you um, use the capabilities of your language, um, JavaScript promises, or um, Netflix has the Rx Java observable implementation, which is quite um, nice as well to do in synchronous and reactive programming. Shall we end on a happy, um, more happy note from Giles? The thing I find interesting about microservice architectures is the flexibility that they give you. And it's the flexibility that you don't even expect you're going to need that's really valuable. Late last year, we were building a sports broadcasting application uh, that was going to cover a three week long tournament of a fairly popular sport. We did some research, we found out how many users to expect. And then when the tournament started, we discovered in the first hour that we were actually getting 100 times more users than we expected. For the first two days, our servers melted. Then on the third day, the tournament had a break, we had a rest and a chance to do what we could to fix it. And this was where the flexibility of the microservice architecture came in. Because the systems that backed up our mobile application were all independent, were small, were easy to understand, and responded predictably to change, we could look across these services and understand where caching differed, where freshness requirements were different. And what we found we were able to do was drop a CDN, content distribution network, between our mobile application and many of our back-end services. And from there, of course, we've made scaling um, performance someone else's problem, which is really what you want it to be. Over the rest of the tournament, um, users and viewers continued to increase and we ended up doubling. Throughout that period, our system did not blink, just happily soaked up the load. And the, ultimately, this is really interesting in that it wasn't even this kind of flexibility that we expected. What we um, expected was to be able to add new features as the tournament progressed. The idea was to start off with an application that you could use to watch the tournament, and then we'd add, enhance it with features that showed you more detail and more insight into what was going on. But we found that using the same architecture and the same approach, we were very easily able to incorporate fairly large-scale architectural changes really simply into the system to deliver the performance we needed. I've since been told that this architecture really needs to be written up and stapled to anyone who doesn't think that flexibility in links and disconnected systems are a valuable thing to build. So that fairly popular sport was the game of chess. What they were building was an iPad application that expected you know, about 100, 120 users to pay a little bit of money and come and watch the game, comments, and enrich the experience of the game. What they learned was nobody was actually uh, wanted to, nobody wanted to pay money to watch the game. So they had these services, they could quickly go online on the web for free and they learned that everybody loves watching game for free online. So they ended up going from 120 user requirements to 6,000 concurrent users. And as Jaid said, they watched the services melt, they reached the maximum number of dinos on Heroku, 100, and they couldn't do anything. So I think from the technical point of view, his point is the same point as um, what James made, which was the coupling between the services, discoverability of the links, and being able to put a cache in between um, and serve the documents that didn't have 
you know, fast refresh, refresh requirements um, behind the cache and um, save the day with 4.5K, I think, they paid for the CDN um, and the tournament was successful. So a few takeaways to leave you with. Um, know your problem really well. Make sure that microservices is actually solving the right problem for you or you have the right problem for this architecture. And if it does, um, if you have the right problem for that, then uh, know your domain really well because there is a very close relationship between your domain and domain capabilities and the services you build. And get yourself one of those giant granularity sliders. Find the right balance for your domain um, and find the right granularity where you get that net um, positive. It's, microservices is not just an architectural um, style. It's, it's, a, it's a change to your organization. It, ne it needs change to the culture of the developers, you know. Pushing the operations capabilities and operations responsibilities to your development team, you know. C structurally change your organization so you can give autonomy to your teams. And um, go slowly, go from, you know, maybe larger services to smaller services. And really build continuous delivery um, from day zero. I don't know if there is such a thing as day zero, but what I mean by that is before writing any service, just build the pipeline that, you know, pushes a hello world service to production. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do, you write your contract test and then you write your services. So um, really grease those de deployment pipelines because they are going to slow you down um, as the number of services grow. And make sure you're tall enough. So Martin Fowler has a new blog um, I think posted recently, and he talks about prerequisites of microservices, you know, rapid deployment, rapid environment provisioning, and if you don't have those and you're not tall enough, you're going to hurt yourself on this ride. So with that, um, a few books, I guess, that I referenced in, in, in the talk. Uh, Sam Newman, one of our colleagues, has a new book coming up. It's um, Building Microservices and Early Releases on O'Reilly. And by the end of the year, I think the, the, the book comes out. And um, yeah, I, I guess all of these books are classics now. And the one that I really like is Implementing Domain-Driven Design, which really gives you um, kind of practical advice as go from domain modeling, talking to your domain experts, buying them coffee so they can come and talk to you, um, all the way to implementing services with event sourcing, CQRS, and so on. It's a pretty good book. And that's about it. Thank you.